All right. So far, our study of gases has been limited to just our exploration in the lab. So this is what we know about gases. And this comes from any previous science course or at a minimum last semester when we talked about solids, liquids, and gases. We know that gas particles are far apart from each other. We know that gases are highly compressible. You physically saw that with your Cartesian diver inside the bulb of the pipette. You could see the gas getting compressed when you squeezed the bottle. We also know that gases completely fill their container. There are no places within a classroom that you could potentially suffocate from because there is no air available to you. The air expands across the entire room in every corner and you have the ability to breathe no matter where you're at. We also know that gases have lower densities than liquids and solids. We know this because air is above the ground um, and it's also above our lakes and oceans. Some things that we need to add to our knowledge, and this is where you need to decide what you're going to write based on what you already know and what you're learning from tonight's lecture. Gases are considered to be fluid. Fluid is not just a term for liquids. The particles of a fluid can easily flow. So that means a solid can be a fluid, a gas can be a fluid, as well as a liquid being a fluid. You should already know that a gas can be a fluid because you've seen our natural gas flow through our hoses and up through and into our Bunsen burners. You have also witnessed this with any home that has a gas burner stove. Gases also have pressure. Now we didn't really talk about it, but you discovered that gases have pressure in our station with the lab quest and the syringe. And you noticed that there was a relationship between the volume of a gas and the amount of pressure that it exerted. Um, pressure comes from the collisions between the particles of the gas itself as well as the walls of the container. Those are what cause pressure. Pressure by definition is force divided by area. You'll learn more about this when you take physics. Finally, measure can, pressure can be measured, sorry, and the SI unit for pressure is the Pascal. The symbol for the Pascal is a capital P, as in Paul, and a lowercase a. This is an extremely small unit. We don't typically like using it because it is so small, so we will typically reserve kilopascals as a way to measure pressure in order to make a unit more workable for us. In the last slide, I kind of told you that the SI unit for pressure is the pascal. So that tells us that pressure has units. You measured pressure in the lab with the lab quest in kilopascal, just like I told you on the last slide. We don't typically use pascals if we can get away with it. But what we can do is convert between different pressure units. Um, and here's a list. This is the equality list of the various pressure units I'm going to hold you accountable for. So please make sure that you write these down. We have atmospheres. Atmospheres are written as ATM. Atmospheres are at atmosphere. Atmospheres are the most commonly used unit of pressure. Um, just because they're easy, we live at one atmosphere of pressure. That's sea level. You do need to know that. Write that down, please. Um, but one atmosphere of pressure is equal to 101.3 kilopascals which is also equal to 760 torr. Torr is a unit uh, for industrial purposes, um, which is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Uh, meteorologists use millimeters of mercury as they measure air pressure with a barometer. Um, and the final equality that we're going to talk about or use for the various problems we're going to solve is PSI. That's pounds per square inch. So pounds per inches squared. 
please take a moment and uh, pause the video and copy down this example. All right, let's take a look. If a tire has a pressure of 43.2 PSI, what is this pressure in atmospheres, in pascals? So we have two different conversion problems we're doing. Um, real quick, uh, tires do get measured in PSI, pounds per square inch. Um, the automotive industry really uses PSI uh, as well as some other industries. So let's take a look. We're going to use dimensional analysis for this, and you're well trained in dimensional analysis, but we'll take a look at part A. We have 43.2 PSI, and we first need to convert to atmospheres. So looking at our line of equalities, when we want to get rid of PSI, we put it on the bottom because anything we want to get rid of, we put on the bottom for dimensional analysis. And that's 14.7 PSI. And to get to atmospheres, we put them on top. And one atmosphere is equal to 14.7 PSI. When we do the math for this problem, we get 2.94, and we need to keep... Uh, three sig figs. So we get 2.94 atmospheres. Oh, atmospheres get kept, sorry. PSI is what gets, um, here we go. PSI gets canceled out. All right, let's take a look at the second part of the problem. We want to know how many pascals this is equal to. I picked pascals because this is probably the worst that you'll see in the book problems as you practice this. Um, we don't have an equality for pascals. We have an equality for kilopascals. So this requires a two-step dimensional analysis problem. So if we, if we rework the problem with 43.2 PSI, we know from the previous problem that there are 14.7 PSI. Now we're going to kilopascals. So that's 101.3 kilopascals, but we don't want kilopascals, so we have to get rid of them in order to get to pascals. This works just like uh, the metric system that we learned in the fall. We have kilopascals and pascals. This is just like kilometers and meters. So kilo is, means a thousand, so the kilopascal is bigger. So 1 kilopascal is equal to 1,000 pascals. When we type this into the calculator and do the math, we get quite a large answer, actually. Let me shrink this down a little bit. We get 2.98 times 10 to the fifth pascals. This is what I mean by we don't like using Pascals, but I wanted to show you what to do if you are asked to get to Pascals um, and our equalities only give us kilopascals. The last thing I want to talk about for tonight's lecture, before we get into gas laws and stuff like that in the upcoming uh, evening lectures, is something called the kinetic molecular theory. Now, it sounds scary, but it's not. You know that kinetic means motion. You know molecular means molecules or particles. So this is just a theory about the motion of gas particles. Um, this theory predicts gas behavior. You are held responsible for knowing the different postulates of this theory. Um, so you should probably make sure you copy this down. But anyways, gas particles, we know this. You have known this for a while. They're in constant, rapid, random motion. Um, they typically are far apart, which is why we can compress them. Uh, they exert pressure as a result of the collisions with themselves and with the walls of their container. These collisions, uh, on a side note, are completely elastic. What that means is the energy is completely transferred during these collisions, which makes the total energy of the system constant. We're really not going to get into that too much right now 
but it's a nice heads up for when you start really looking at energy and elastic collisions and non-elastic collisions in physics. The final postulate of the kinetic molecular theory has to do with temperature. The gas temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy. Believe it or not, we did actually learn this uh, in first semester when we learned about energy and uh, the energy of a system and specific heat. The particles of any substance are directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the substance. So what that means is when the particles are moving faster, the temperature of the substance is higher. So this falls in line right with uh, gas temperatures as well. Now you might be wondering, I know all of this, Mrs. Smith. Why do I really care? Well, what scientists did was they created this big umbrella called the kinetic molecular theory, and they threw everything they knew about gases underneath it to help us uh, attempt to predict gas behavior. So once again, you are held responsible for knowing the different postulates within the theory, but at the same time, you kind of already do know them. Have a great evening. I'll see you guys tomorrow. For our last topic tonight, I want to talk about diffusion versus effusion. Diffusion is what you saw with the perfume. We had one student spray the perfume, and the perfume diffused all the way to the other person who was timing, uh -oh, who was timing how long it took until they could smell it. This is diffusion. Effusion, on the other hand, is what happens when your balloon deflates overnight. So what happened to the air particles that were all in here? Well, over the process of the evening, they worked themselves out of the balloon. And then the next day, the balloon is empty. This also works with tires. If you get a nail in your tire, over the course of a few days, the air particles are going to find their way out of the tire based on a very teeny tiny hole created from the nail. This is called effusion. This is when gas particles work themselves out of their container through a tiny passage or hole.